Good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Tim McChristian, the Executive Director of Madison Square Boys and Girls Club. We're excited for you to join us together as we will learn more about the COVID-19 vaccine. I know you all have questions, so please sit back, let's listen to the experts, and be ready to get your questions answered. Tonight we'll be joined by three healthcare specialists from the NYU Langone Health Center and the Deputy Public Advocate who are all on the front lines learning about the vaccine and getting it distributed to New Yorkers. A special thanks to Dowell Consulting for putting this event together. I also know many of our Madison staff and member families are watching tonight. Thank you for being here. We also wanna welcome anyone who doesn't know about Madison and encourage you to learn more about us. Madison Square Boys and Girls Club's mission since 1884 is to provide a safe, stable, and supportive after-school environment for our members ages six to 18 through our six clubhouse programs across Brooklyn, the Bronx, and Harlem, which unfortunately also are some of the communities hardest hit by the COVID virus. We make sure our members have an enriching experience and are given the opportunity to grow in academic success, good character and citizenship, and healthy lifestyle and choices. Tonight, we wanna to tap into that healthy lifestyle goal. Thanks for being here with us and wanting to learn. For our Spanish speaking family and community members, we provided a link on the madisoncovid.eventbrite.com website to a similar program in Spanish for your review. We will also put it in the comments section on YouTube and Facebook. I know COVID has taken its toll on all of us over the past year. People in our communities have lost jobs, lost loved ones, and lost their normal way of life. There is growing fear and isolation, anxiety, and depression. But according to Dr. Fauci and others we hear every day on television, there is exciting positive news and the end of the pandemic could be in sight. We're told the COVID vaccines are giving us a way back to normalcy, perhaps by the end of the year. But let's be real, many of us are skeptical. Should we trust this vaccine? Is it safe? Are there more negatives and positives? I also realize these concerns are felt not just by the vaccination eligible citizens aged 65 and over, like myself, who's actually had both shots, but also by younger essential workers, like our own Madison staff members and their peers, who are eligible to receive the vaccination due to their job responsibilities under our contract with the New York Department of Education. These 20 and 30 year olds are not signing up for the vaccination, even though they're now eligible. I recently read an article about the Penn Medical Health System where their own black employees had only signed up at 22% to receive the vaccination compared to 62% of their eligible white employees. That's why we want to take the time with you tonight to talk about the vaccines and try to separate truth from rumor where possible. We're gonna learn a lot from our guests tonight but we also want you to be able to ask your questions. So if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, type your questions into the comments section below. We've already received many questions from members of our community, which we will plan to answer. First up, we're gonna tackle the topics of hesitancy, safety, and side effects of taking the COVID vaccine. Then we'll meet the rest of our panel and discuss your questions. I wanna bring on our first guest, Dr. Aisha Langford. Dr. Langford is a population health expert and research specialist at the NYU Langone Health Center. Hi, thank you for Hi. having me. Hi, Dr. Langford, thanks for joining us tonight. Tell us a little bit more about yourself and your work related to the COVID-19 vaccine. Sure. Well, I have a background in public health. And when pre-COVID, I studied health communication and medical decision making. During the pandemic, I've been able to help advise our vaccine center on how to enhance uh, diversity in our clinical trials and also strategies to get the word out about vaccine education. Great. Well, can you share with us how your work as a population health expert has been so crucial during this pandemic and what it means to you personally? Sure. Well, population health, as evidenced by the name, is really everyone. And so this has been um, a very interesting and growing experience for me as a public health and population health professional. And it's really been a blessing to be able to participate on town halls like this and to be of service to my family members and friends and colleagues who I never thought would be reaching out to me to help them find information about vaccines um, in my 
other life, I generally am focusing on cancer screening and hypertension management, but it's been a, a real blessing and I'm, I'm glad that I've been able to help however I can. Great. Well, I know you brought a very um, thoughtful presentation that addresses this issue of hesitancy. So I'd like to ask you to take it away. Okay, great. And before I go into my full presentation, we're actually going to watch a short video that I had the privilege of being in a, a few weeks ago, and now it's on YouTube. And so it's being queued up. And uh, a version of this video is also available in Spanish. And I believe that will be posted somewhere uh, after our presentation today. By now, you've probably heard that two vaccines for coronavirus have been approved for emergency use. But what you might not know is, are they safe and how do they work? Hi, I'm Aisha Langford, Assistant Professor of Population Health at NYU Langone Health. And today we're gonna to answer those questions for you. The speed at which the COVID-19 vaccine was developed has been a primary source of vaccine hesitancy. While it's true that these vaccines were developed and distributed in record time, it doesn't mean that safety was compromised. Typically, a trial looks like this. Platforms are developed in animal models for a few years before phase one trials can begin. But in the case of coronavirus, the platform had already been developed. As far back as 2004, researchers were already working on what's called a messenger RNA vaccine platform. More on that in a minute. The COVID-19 coronavirus is close enough genetically to two other coronaviruses, SARS and MERS. And so scientists could piggyback off the work that had already been done on vaccine development for those two viruses. That saved a huge chunk of time. So when COVID-19's genetic sequence became available in January of 2020, scientists were immediately able to start work on the RNA vaccines. Next are the three phases of trials, which can typically last one to two years each. The different phases relate to patient populations. Phase one trials are usually small, and then each subsequent phase involves more people. Realizing that time was of the essence, these trials were supersized and phases two and three were combined. All patients were monitored for safety and efficacy, and those data were submitted to the FDA in December of 2020. An outside panel of experts reviewed the data and the FDA authorized RNA vaccines <coughs> for emergency use authorization starting in December. Furthermore, Pfizer and Moderna were able to save time by producing large quantities of their vaccines before the emergency use authorization so that distribution could begin immediately once emergency use was authorized. So now that you know how they were developed, you might be wondering how they actually work. There are many different types of vaccines or vaccine platforms, but the two that are approved for use as of January 2021 are a platform called mRNA. The purpose of any vaccine is to safely train the human body's immune system with the part of a virus in order to activate an immune response. In the case of COVID-19 mRNA vaccines, the part of the targeted virus we're focusing on is what's called the spike protein. It's this little thing here. The mRNA included in the vaccine has the genetic code of this spike protein. And once injected into our bodies, that little genetic blueprint begins to build these spike proteins. Our body's immune system then mounts an immune response, including antibodies and T cells to this foreign protein. Since the vaccine contains only the spike protein and not the actual virus itself, there's no risk of getting coronavirus from the vaccine. Vaccines are a glowing example of the advancements of modern medicine. They will save millions of lives and help this country and the world get back to normal. And hopefully as we continue to distribute this vaccine, we can begin to put this dark chapter behind us. In the meantime, remember to maintain social distancing and wear your mask, even after you receive the vaccine. If you have any questions about the vaccine, you can visit these sources. Thank you and stay safe. All right, it's always a little weird to see myself on a video and camera, but I hope that video was helpful. And as they're pulling up my slides, um, it's been, like I said, really amazing to help contribute uh, to educating the public and my friends and patients about the vaccines. And I, I really do hope that as we have more town halls like this and more opportunities for people to ask questions and to share that more and more people would be comfortable with getting that vaccine. All right. So I will just go right into it. Uh, you can go to the next slide. 
So this is a picture of the continuum of vaccine acceptance. So all the way to the left would be people that we categorize as refusing all vaccines. Some folks may call them anti-vaxxers. Um, and then all the way to the right, like the green people would be folks like me who tend to get all of the recommended, uh, recommended vaccines. And in the middle would be what we would call people who may be vaccine hesitant. And I always like to point out that I think it's very normal and logical for people to be hesitant and a little bit uncertain because over the last year, there's just been so much information about COVID and so much information about the vaccines. So it's absolutely normal if you're on the fence and hopefully uh, this session will help alleviate some of your concerns. Next slide. Okay, and this is a slide of data from the Kaiser Family Foundation. They published a survey in December of 2020. And this screen is really a snapshot of different groups of people that have expressed vaccine hesitancy. And towards the top are the groups that express the most vaccine hesitancy. And the groups at the very bottom are the ones that have the, a lower amount of vaccine hesitancy. But the main takeaway here is that a lot of people have vaccine hesitancy. It's not just minorities. It's not just young people. It's associated with political party and where people live and a whole bunch of things. So a, a lot of people have concerns. Next slide. So now I want to share a little bit about my own participation in the Pfizer phase one clinical trial for the COVID vaccine. So in May of 2020, I got a text message from my pastor, my old pastor in Michigan. And she said she saw something on NBC News that NYU was going to be having this new vaccine trial. And I actually hadn't heard about it until she told me. And I just think it's really interesting that she saw something on the news in Michigan and texted me. So next slide, or sorry, next, yeah. So after I did some research about it, I got really, really uh, interested and I actually went on to NYU's clinical trial website and I filled out information just as a private person in the world. I didn't say, hey, I work for NYU, hook me up. I just did the online Info, information sheet like everybody else in the world can do. And that was in early May. Next slide. In June, I got a call that uh, there were still slots available for the phase one clinical trial. And I did all the screening criteria and I decided to join. And as I mentioned in the video, phase one trials are literally the first in humans. So there was preclinical work done for some of the COVID vaccines, but the phase one was literally the first people kind of in the world <laughs> to get acts or to, to get the vaccine. And I wanted a lot of people have asked me, why in the world would you do that? Really first in human study. So there are a few reasons. Um, first, I'm relatively healthy. And I had the time, I had control of my time. And so I was able to participate and contribute, which was really, really important to me. I also have spent over a decade encouraging people to consider clinical trial participation. When I was a PhD student at University of Michigan, my whole dissertation project was actually on how to enhance participation of minorities in particular in clinical trials. But a little bit closer to home, I actually have a really good friend who had COVID early in the pandemic and had a very difficult time. He was hospitalized for several days. Luckily, he is better, but now he has some what they call long-term effects. So he actually has scar tissue in his lungs. And before COVID, he was a very young, um, healthy person, traveled a lot, and now he has these lingering issues. And so I wanted to help other people not have to get COVID and contributing to a clinical trial was one way to do that. And then separately, um, because I always get recommended vaccines, I, I was a little bit selfish. I wanted to be able to get a vaccine before the rest of the world. And sometimes a clinical trial will be the first way that you can get a new therapy or a promising therapy. And it turns out that in um, July of 2020, when I got my shots, it turns out that I actually got the active Pfizer vaccine. So I have been, I guess, protected before the rest of the world uh, since July of 2020. Next slide, please. And uh, 
again, I'm, I'm really excited that I was able to contribute to the clinical trial. I'm actually still in the clinical trial. So they are following us for two years. And my last visit for the clinical trial will actually be in July of 2022. So some people have been asking questions about how do we know it works? How long will it work? And myself and the other 70,000 plus people who participated in the clinical trials are contributing information that will help answer some of those questions. Next slide. So now I wanna talk about social norms and this idea that we need the right messages and the right messengers, which means people in all places to be helping to get the word out about the vaccines. So this is a, a quote that I gave in the New York Times in December, and it was talking about how do we support people? How do we change social norms? And I said, it's important to know who are the people they trust and who are they looking to, to gauge their norms? It might be a doctor, it might be an influencer, mom or dad on social media. Next slide. So these are some pictures you might recognize some of these folks. So the person all the way to the left is in the middle is a picture, that's a picture of Elvis Presley. So Elvis was a rock star in the 40s and 50s. And that's a picture of him actually getting the polio vaccine in 1956, right before he went, went on the Ed Sullivan show. And the polio vaccine at that time was very new. People weren't trusting it. They weren't sure that the scientists were telling them the truth and they were hesitant. And that was 1956. And um, so maybe they weren't trusting the doctors, but people really, really liked Elvis. And I think he was like 21 years old in that picture. So he got his vaccine on camera. And after that, a lot of people felt more comfortable getting the vaccine. In the middle is a picture of Dr. Alexis Mieses Malchuk, and she's a family practice doctor at uh, in the University of North Carolina system. She was one of the first uh, people in North Carolina to get the vaccine in December, and she self-identifies as Afro-Latina and white. And there was an article that she was a part of in Oprah magazine, and she talked about how it was just important for her to be an example and to encourage Black and Latino people in particular to consider getting the vaccine. And then on the picture on the right is a picture of Tyler Perry. So he did a town hall at the end of January. Uh, it was a special that appeared on BET. And it was a forum similar to this for people or for him to ask questions that a lot of people were asking. And at the end of that 30 minute special, he actually got his first vaccine shot for the COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide. But it's important to know that you don't have to be a rock star or a doctor or Elvis Presley <laughs> to be important. We have been doing several town halls like this with local community centers, um, HCCI. So on the top right uh, picture, there is a panel that I was on in November with Dr. Mulligan and uh Nurse Davis and several of my colleagues at the Vaccine Center. And that was focused on um, answering questions for the African American community. And then on the lower picture there, uh, that's Dr. Kant Cap is actually in that photo too. And that was a town hall of the Spanish speaking town hall that we've done as well. And really the goal of these town halls is to create a safe space where people can ask questions and feel okay um, getting their questions answered and not feeling pressure to do anything. Next slide. This is a snapshot of a survey that was done in December. And I thought it was really interesting. It, the company is called Morning Consult. And the main takeaway that I thought was interesting from this snapshot is that regardless of people's racial or ethnic identity, whether they were white, Hispanic, black, or of another race, everyone identified that family would be the most impactful group of people that they would listen to. And if they heard encouragement from family that they would be most likely to be vaccinated. So I just want all of us listening to be encouraged that you don't have to be a celebrity to be impactful. Next slide. Now I'm going to go into some commonly asked questions and concerns that have come up on the town halls that I've been a part of. So the first two questions are, can I get COVID from the mRNA vaccines? And the answer is no. It's impossible to get COVID from the vaccines. And another question is, will the vaccines change my DNA? That answer is also no. It's basically impossible for the mRNA vaccines to change your DNA. It does not interact with DNA at all. Next. 
Other questions are, should pregnant women get the vaccine? And Dr. Kotkamp is going to talk a little bit more about that later. But broadly speaking, the biggest organization that represents obstetricians and gynecologists basically say that pregnant women should not uh, be withheld from getting the COVID-19 vaccines and that they should talk to their healthcare providers to make a good decision for them. And then also with regard to fertility, the, the largest uh, society that kind of represents and advocates for fertility services, it's called the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. They also have a statement that people who are trying to conceive and have a child. Um, there's no reason for them to not get the COVID-19 vaccines. And in fact, they actually recommend vaccination in general as a way to keep your body healthy um, and safe, which is really important if you're trying to have a baby. Next. Okay. And another question that keeps coming up is who was actually represented in the clinical trials? And so in short, there were older adults age 65 and older, there were racial and ethnic minorities. There were women. There were men. There were people with a lot of different underlying health conditions, including HIV, including diabetes, including heart disease. So there was a range of, of medical conditions. And another question that I get sometimes is, what about children? Is it going to be safe for children? And so broadly speaking, in the clinical trials, um, in the Pfizer trials, uh, Teenagers 16 and 17 were included in those phase three trials. They were not included in the Moderna trial, but now both of those two uh, pharmaceutical companies are now conducting clinical trials in children 12 and above. So we will have more data about children in the upcoming months, which is exciting. Next slide. Okay, other concerns are not trusting the process because it was so fast. And I've explained a little bit of that in the video. But in general, um, sometimes things in science and in life go slowly because you don't have enough money and you don't have the right people. And in this case, there was almost unlimited funding to help support the vaccines. They also had top scientists from around the world working together at the same time. And we had over 15 years of knowledge to build upon. So we had a, a jump start. And that's part of the reasons why they were developed so fast. Some people don't want to be first to receive the vaccine. And now that there have been over 70,000 people in the clinical trials and millions of first doses given, uh, it's actually impossible for you to be very first. But I think the heart of that question is people kind of want to wait and see what happens. There are concerns about side effects, and Dr. Kotkep will talk about that shortly. And then also uh, what I've noticed coming up in the last few weeks are concerns about fairness and equity. So for the people who want to get the vaccine, will the vaccine be available in the community's hardest hit in Brooklyn, in the Bronx, in Staten Island? And will they will access to that be convenient and easy? And also questions coming up about what about the senior citizens who can't leave their house? What about people with disabilities? How do we all work really hard to make sure that everyone who wants to get the vaccine can get it in a way that is very convenient? So there are talks about that. And that's very encouraging to me. Next slide. There uh, have I've had people ask me if they should take vitamin D and herbal supplements. So there is no good evidence that vitamin D by itself will prevent someone from getting COVID. And there's also no good evidence that once people have COVID, that high doses of vitamin D will be a good treatment. But separate from COVID, vitamin D is good for your bones. And vitamin D does play a role in your immune system. So you can get vitamin D from the sun. You can get vitamin D from food, or you can take supplements. If you decide to take supplements, it's a good idea just to talk to your healthcare team first to make sure you're taking safe levels and not taking too much. And then with regard to herbal supplements, um, just because something is natural does not mean that it is safe. And there are some herbal supplements that um, can impact and harm your liver. And there's other herbal supplements that can interact with over-the-counter medications and prescription medications. So if you're considering herbal supplements, it's a good idea to talk to your own personal physician or a pharmacist just to make sure that whatever you're doing or whatever you're thinking about doing can be done in the safest way possible. Next slide. Now I'm going to show a little article from the New York Times, which I thought was really fascinating. I get the morning, I don't know what you call it, like morning briefing from the New York Times. And there was a, a blurb last week about 
uh, the cost of vaccine alarmism. And I wasn't familiar with that term. Next, next slide. So vaccine alarmism is this idea that, uh, next slide, or next, that people will say things like, oh, well, coronavirus vaccines aren't 100% effective. You know, vaccinated people may still be contagious and there's new virus variants out there. And after you get the vaccine, you still have to wear your mask and wash your hands and social distancing. So kind of what's the point? Like, why do we have a vaccine if we still have to do all of this? And I think that kind of distracts us from the big, big picture. Next slide. Next slide. And so the author says, you know, much, much of this messaging has some basis in truth, but it's misleading. Next, next slide. And the evidence so far suggests that a full dose of the vaccine with the appropriate waiting period after the second shot effectively eliminates risk of COVID-19 death, nearly eliminates the risk of hospitalization, and drastically reduces a person's ability to affect infect someone else. And so the big picture is the reason why these vaccines are important is because we're trying to prevent more deaths. As many of you know, we're already have crossed over 500,000 deaths in the US and we want to reduce hospitalizations. And the, that's really the big, big picture. Next slide. Okay, and uh, this is my second to last slide. The This was an article again from the the Kaiser Family Foundation about what type of messages may work best. And in general, it's better to focus on protecting people from illness, confirming that the vaccines are effective, and this idea that we all really want to return back to normal life. And those are the type of messages and conversations that seem to resonate with people and will make them more likely to get the COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide. These are some resources that I just wanted to share with all of you. If you're interested in the NYU specific uh, cl vaccine clinical trials, you can Google um, our vaccine center. Clinicaltrials.org, I'm sorry, clinicaltrials.gov is a website that has clinical trials and research opportunities for all type of conditions if you want to learn more. The CDC is a wonderful website to get up-to-date information about the COVID-19 vaccines, but also other health conditions. And Medline Plus is also a very reliable and trusted source of information for a variety of health conditions. Next slide. And then lastly, I really like this campaign from the United Nations. They have a website called shareverified.com. And if any of you in the audience want to be an information volunteer, they, uh, you can sign up and I get like a couple emails a week with vetted up-to-date information about the COVID-19 vaccines. And then I'm able to share that on my social media platforms if I'd like. But the idea here is that part of the reason that people are vaccine hesitant is because there's so much misinformation out in the world. So this is just to remind ourselves, if you get something, pause before you share it, take care before you share it, make sure you've actually read it, ask where is it coming from. And if you have any concerns about that information, do not share it on social media. And I think that's it. Next slide. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them tonight, but you can also email me or call me. And thank you very much. Great, well, thank you, Dr. Langford. You obviously addressed a lot of the issues around the hesitancy that we see in our communities. And as a bonus, I was very pleased to hear that you actually live in Harlem, not too far from our Pinkerton Clubhouse. Yes. So you talked about the importance of people listening to people that they trust. So I'm confident that you're already talking to members of our Madison family in the Harlem area. So thank you. Right. I look forward to a party there when we can all gather. So all right. you all heard it. Tim's going to throw a party for all of us. <laughs> uh, we're going to come back to you in a little bit with more questions. Next, I would like to bring on Dr. Angelica Cifuentes Kotkamp. Her career has been focused on researching vaccines for many infectious diseases, including COVID-19. Hi, good evening, everyone. Welcome, Dr. Kotkamp, and thank you so much for being here. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and your work with the COVID-19 vaccine. Sure, thank you. I. So this is the other side of uh, what Aisha was telling you. Since the pandemic started, I joined all the clinical trials and I actually am one of the investigators in the trial that Aisha is a patient of. So early enough, I learned about vaccine trials. I've been working with the vaccines uh, since phase one and two of Pfizer. 
Uh, later, we started doing the trials with AstraZeneca vaccine, and very soon we will be working with the Sanofi vaccine. So doing all this work during the pandemic has allowed me to learn a lot about vaccines, specifically COVID. Wow. Well, how has all that work with these various vaccines affected you personally? Well, you know, I, I think from the infectious diseases perspective, it was this pandemic has been really hard on, on us, on healthcare workers and infectious diseases doctors. I remember myself back in April being very overwhelmed with so much illness in the hospital. And, and it, the hospital was literally like a war hospital. It was really bad. And then when I learned about the vaccines, this was the only thing that gave me hope. And this is the only thing that gave me that need and that like hope to keep going and keep working and, and believing that there was an exit to this pandemic. So uh, now that we see these fantastic results, I, I think it was so worth it. And uh, the work that we did uh, with patients like Aisha in the trials, I am um, myself also a, a participant in another trial uh, has been phenomenal and it has been an amazing experience. Great. Well, we look forward to hearing what you have to say about the vaccines, their safety and side effects. So please take it away. Excellent. So, okay. So I can start seeing my slides, please. Thank you. Okay, so I am uh, I'm one of the infectious diseases uh, doctors at NYU. I also work at Bellevue Hospital, um, primary working with my uh, HIV clinic and uh, with many patients of the infectious disease community. Uh, next slide, happy to be here tonight. Our um, vaccine center is an NIH funded um, site. There are only 10 sites like these in the United States, and we really focus on the investigation and the research on vaccines and advancement of uh, vaccine research. Next, we have a mission, and that is to protect and restore human health through innovate, innovative vaccine research. And for this work, community is essential. And that's why we try and, and try very hard to get involved with community. We like to be close to the community, to hear the community, because that's part of the work or of a successful vaccine center, building that trust and that connection with the community. Next. So let's get into the topic. We are going to talk tonight about vaccine safety. And uh, as many of you, uh, we addressed already some of the questions, but there are a lot of questions out there. And I hope that after tonight, you get the chance to express your questions and I hope we are able to answer them. So the first one, and this is a big question, are vaccines safe? Next. So uh, the short answer is yes. By now, millions, not thousands, millions of people have received the COVID-19 vaccine. In the, in the US, over 65 million uh, doses of the COVID-19 vaccine have been administered as of February 23rd of 2021. And this is just the US. Just think about all the other countries where vaccines have already been given to many people. So by now, if there are side effects and things like that that are going to present, I think we have an amazing amount of data because we have millions of people that have millions that have received this vaccination. Next. So to start with the conception of how these vaccines have been and are where they are right now, the vaccine journey starts in the lab. And as we saw in the video, this is coming from many scientists uh, it is important to recognize that we have really good scientists working on vaccines. These are people that have many, many years of education and work on a specific pathogen or on a specific way to produce a vaccine. So these are people that are very smart and they know what they're doing. They uh, come together, they put together all the, these ideas, and then they came with all these different uh, vaccine types. Once the vaccines have a good profile in cell cultures and like in the lab environment, they test these subsequently in animals and then they go to humans. And that's what was phase one. So next. 
they also, to, in order to prepare this vaccine and to get information about how to make these vaccines good, they look at uh, medical journals and work on previous vaccines and previous epidemics, and they use that information to create new vaccines. So when we say that this vaccine was so fast, it's not really that fast, is that this is possible because of the work that had been done before. Next. Then we go through the phase one, two, and three, as we saw in the previous video. So by the time the vaccine is ready, it has been given already to thousands of patients in all these uh, clinical trials. Next, we have then several meetings. Um, and then these people are very experts. They are looking carefully at safety data. So they review all the information. They review person by person cases in, and see if somebody got a headache, uh, a rash or things like that. So there are several committees, the DSMB, the ACIP, the FDA. And when all these experts review the information and they decide that the information doesn't have any red flag or that the information is safe, they approve the vaccine for use. In this case, for emergency use authorization. And in another case, it will be just approved for non-emergency for any situation. Next. Then you go to the vaccine manufacturing. And in a non-pandemic time, you have maybe just one pharmaceutical company creating just a couple of doses because they didn't get enough money from the government uh, to invest in a massive production. But this is COVID, this is pandemic. So we have several pharmaceutical companies working on the production of these vaccines in a very accelerated uh, pace. So these people are getting massive injections of money so they can produce all the demand. Just imagine we are like several billions of people in the world. So we need a lot of doses. One pharmaceutical company is not going to be able to produce all these doses. So they really need to pick up the pace and make all this production fast enough so we all can get vaccinated. Next. Now let's talk more about the development. And uh, this is about how was the vaccine developed in this timeline and how we are ensuring the safety of the vaccine. Next, we had, uh, can next let's do all the bullets. So there are several, um, several topics here. As I was saying uh, previously, there is an intense effort by all sectors, not only the sector of the economy, the pharmaceutical company, the doctors, the participants, um, their, their researchers are using existing clinical data and ex existing clinical trial networks to be able to conduct these COVID trials. So previous networks that we had existed for trials, for, for example, trials that have to do with HIV or trials that had to do with other things, we just put all these networks together and were able to dis distribute the information and, and, and have all these vaccine centers available to all these different universities in many, many states. Then the manufacturing started even before the vaccines were approved, just in anticipation. And that was a very risky move, but I think it was worth it. And then uh, it's important to recognize that the mRNA vaccines are faster to produce than traditional vaccines. So they were able to produce a lot of these vaccines rapidly. And now FDA and the CDC are prioritizing the review of this particular data so they can approve this information really fast. I can tell you that working in the pandemic for trials meant a lot of work. It meant working long hours. So we all were under this pressure and under this rush to get things done. Not cutting corners, but just like working a lot harder than we will have done in another non-pandemic thing. Okay, next. Now, possible reactions. By now, you probably, I hope you have heard uh, some comments from people close to you. So we know, and this is based on data from all these millions of people that have received the vaccine, but also from the participants in the clinical trials. The most common reactions are sore arm, wherever uh, we get the injection. So you're gonna feel some sore arm, that's normal, and that's gonna get better. We have uh, people, some, some people can have some chills or low grade fever. Some people have had a headache 
or nausea, or they can feel very tired or feeling that they have body aches. But these are only symptoms that last transitorily and they get better in the next day or two. For most of the participants, these are the symptoms. Other people get nothing. What we saw is that in many cases, the older the person is, is uh, the least symptoms that person gets. So we are seeing a lot of reactogenicity, as we call it, in the younger groups. And then the elderly tend to get less reactogenicity, which is very good. So in this picture, number one grandma probably will have felt maybe a little bit of just fatigue, but probably not the same symptoms that like me uh, had when I got the vaccine. Next. And uh, of course, and there are other reactions that are absolutely very, very, very rare that are allergies. So as you guys know, some when you look at the population in a community, a society, you're gonna find people that have a lot of allergies to I don't know, drugs, some medications, some chemicals, pollen, eggs, pets, right? There are several, several different allergies, but that doesn't mean that because you don't know you have an allergy and you want to get a dog, that doesn't mean that you are not getting a dog because you could have an allergy. You go ahead and get your dog and then if you develop allergy to the dog, then that's too sad, but you're not going to make a decision of not getting a dog based on the possibility, rare possibility that you may be allergic. So it's the same situation with vaccines. These allergies are very rare, two to five people in one million, but exist and it's important to tell people that if someone has a lot of allergies to many medications, to many environmental things, and this person probably already has an EpiPen, so they should tell uh, the doctor that they're about to get the vaccine so the medical people are prepared in case that the person develops an allergy and, and needs immediate attention. The vaccine is still recommended for people that have allergies, pollen, peanuts, things like that. But if you have a lot of allergies, it's better to discuss with your doctor so you are prepared and, and know what steps to take. Okay, next. So this is another key factor and uh, is that after the shot, everybody gets observed in the site about 15 minutes. And if someone has history of allergies, they can observe them for over 30 minutes. It's important to tell that the allergies, if someone is gonna develop an allergic reaction, so if someone is in that two to five persons for every million, uh, that person is going to have a reaction in the first 30 minutes, in the first 10 or 15 minutes for sure. So it's not that you're going to go home and then suddenly out of the blue at home, you're going to have this reaction. That's not how these type of allergies work. So if there is a reaction that is going to happen, it's going to happen right after the, the shot. And that's why we're keeping people under observation for 15 minutes to make sure the shot went smooth, which is mostly the case. And then the person can go home and for sure it's going to have some other milder symptoms at home. Important also to say for these symptoms, people are allowed to take a pill, uh, something like a Tylenol or an ibuprofen or some medication in case that the person gets a really bad headache or some very uncomfortable sensation. So it's OK. People can take a Tylenol or an ibuprofen and then they're going to be fine. Next. Um, this is a very important website. It's called the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. And this is, um, this is a site where all the effects are reported when someone gets a vaccine, not only for COVID, but in general. When someone gets a vaccine and gets any type of reaction, all these symptoms are reported in this, in this particular site. And this is a database that is run uh, by the CDC and the FDA. So all the information about safety related to vaccines is here. And that is important that so far, uh, this website and the authorities that are regulating this have not detected any patterns that have caused death in any participant or in any person that has received the COVID vaccine. So this is very reassuring information. There are millions of people that have received the vaccine and there is not even a single report that can be uh, related to this particular vaccine in terms of death. Next. 
Okay, so by now you probably hear a lot of uh, things, things like, oh, vaccines can cause autism. I, I know this is like the longest and the oldest myth. It's important to say that this is false. Vaccines do not cause autism. But vaccines help to protect not only the person who gets, the, who gets vaccinated, but the community as well. And that's the beauty because you are doing this not only for yourself, but you're doing this for the ones that you love and the ones that you respect and the ones that you want to be with. Like we see in the picture, we want to go back to share our time with the people that we like to play uh, with our grandparents safely. So this is a good opportunity to provide that safety to them, but also to yourself. Next. Now we're going to change a little bit gears here. And I just wanted to ask, and you don't have to answer this to me, but do you know what's polio? And I want you to think about this for a second. I know many people are not familiar with polio. Many people probably don't even know what this is. So for those that don't know, this is a disease, next, that uh, because of vaccine has been eradicated. So there are other vaccines uh, that work very well, like the vaccine for diphtheria, polio, and measles. And as you can see in the graphs, since the introduction of the vaccines, the curves of number of cases went down dramatically. So this is just to show you that vaccines work and that we have to trust them because they have an excellent record of keeping these infectious diseases at margin. For your own interest, go later on Google Polio and you will see that for now, it's, it's amazing that we don't have to worry about this type of diseases thanks to vaccination. I hope we reach the same point with COVID. Next. So vaccines work again. Here are two graphs that are very good graphs in terms of efficacy. So you, what you see in these two plots is two lines, one going up, one going down. And uh, the graphs that are going up represent the number of COVID cases that happen in these vaccine trials. And the graph that is going down, the, the red graphs, the red lines, represent the people that receive the vaccines, either Moderna to the right or Pfizer to the left. And you can really tell the difference. So who is getting COVID in this representation, in this graph? Definitely the people that did not get the vaccine. You can see how the protections start like right after 14 days and it keeps going. So when you see a graph like this, you probably don't need to learn anything else. You just see a big difference. And this is an amazing graph that tells you that vaccines really protect and they have an excellent efficacy. 95%, that is, that is really good. Next. So why do we need to get vaccinated? We want to decrease death and serious diseases as much as possible. We want to preserve functioning of society. We want to reduce the extra burden of the diseases having on people already facing these parties. We want to socialize safely again. And we want to increase the chance for everyone to enjoy health and well-being. As you see, all these, all these reasons are not just reasons about you or in yourself not getting sick, but it's, it's really important to take uh, into your brain and your conscious that you're part of a society and that we need a little bit of each of us to succeed as society. If we want to go back to socializing with the people that we like to do, if we want to see our grandparents like grandma here happy and we can share more time with them, this is why we need to do this. So it's, it's more a, it's, it's that concept of being part of something big like society. We all have that responsibility. Next. Now, um, just final points about some particular uh, conditions. So we're going to touch on pregnancy and uh, also in children a little bit. We have excellent data in elderly, which is uh, great. So we can recommend this vaccine for elderly, we have patients uh, that have received this vaccine and get great protection and uh, uh, 65 plus. And immunocompromised patients have been 
part of the uh, trials. So we know these vaccines work very well in people with conditions like HIV. Next. So pregnancy. By, this, by February of 2021, about 20,000 pregnant people had received the vaccine in the US. This is, this is not an insignificant number of people. It's 20,000 people that have received the vaccine. And so far, there is no evidence that the vaccine is dangerous to them or to the babies. We know that COVID is very dangerous to them and uh, that there are several repercussions of COVID in not only the health of the mother, but also the health of the baby. Uh, so we know that. And so far, we know that the vaccine is not causing any harm to the mom or the baby. As Aisha was mentioning early, there are uh, several societies that strongly recommend the vaccine in pregnant individuals, and they should have the discussion with their doctors. There is no evidence either to believe that the vaccine affects the safety of breast milk. Uh, if something, the antibodies that mom creates will go through the breast milk and then baby could have uh, could receive some of those, or some antibodies that are passed through the placenta can be uh, passed to the baby circulation. And then when baby is born, uh, baby will have some antibodies, but definitely not the vaccine, no, not the virus. Next. Same goes for children. So we are learning more about vaccines and kids. Moderna is authorized for 18 year old uh and, and Pfizer for 16, and the studies on younger people are underway. Uh, for those of you that have your family members, please encourage them to get the vaccine. And at the same time, you guys are like super pros on technology, so you should take ownership and help your parents and grandparents in the scheduling vaccines and navigating the uh, Google and all these technology that they are probably not are not so good like you are. Next. So to finalize, uh, important to learn how to talk to your family and friends about the vaccine. Your job is to learn about vaccines, use good sources, choose to get vaccinated yourself when it's your turn, start your conversations early with the people that you love and tell the ones you love to get vaccinated and also help them to get vaccinated navigating the system. That's a picture of me when I got my vaccine back in September as a part of the COVID trial of Moderna. And on the top picture is my boss also getting his vaccine. And we got this nice sticker that we can show uh, as COVID vaccine recipients. Next. So with this, it's our privilege to do this work. We hope we can crush this virus and we count on you. Next. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Kotkamp. It was very helpful to understand the safety and thorough research that went into the vaccine. As a senior myself, I can say I had no reaction after any of my, the first or second shot. So I do understand and appreciate um, sometimes age has its privileges. Good, good for you. I, I got actually some, some like pain in my arm and I was uncomfortable. I got better by the evening, but I was like, oh. Yeah. Well, at this point, I'd like to bring back Dr. Langford and invite our other guests to the panel. During this session, we're gonna continue our discussion and begin to answer questions from the community. First, I'd like to introduce nurse practitioner, Tamia Davis. Tamia, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you've done on the front lines battling COVID? Of course, good, e good evening, everyone. My name is Tamia Davis and I'm a nurse practitioner at NYU Langone's Vaccine Center. I work collectively with my team to recruit, screen, and enroll participants into COVID-19 vaccine clinical trials. Before working at the Vaccine Center, I worked as an inpatient registered nurse for six years. And the last year that I worked on the floor as a nurse, I worked on a unit that became one of the first COVID-19 ICUs. Wow, thank you. I'd now like to welcome Jamela Rose, who is in New York City, Deputy Public Advocate for Civic and Community Empowerment. Welcome, Jamela. Please tell Hi. us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing in the community around this whole COVID <laughs> pandemic. Hi, first of all, thank you so much for hosting 
the session and for having me. Um, so at the Public Advocates Office, I do focus on um, immigrant justice, um, also matters of equity as it pertains to voting rights and community empowerment. So um, a lot of our work coming out of this office, of course, and some of the work that the Public Advocate has been doing is just ensuring that there's equity across the board, whether it was through testing, whether it was through um, vac available vaccine sites and vaccine access for those who wanted to, to do that. Um, that's really where our work has been focusing for the last few few weeks. I'm happy to turn it back over to you and we can get the panel started. Great. Well, let's get going. We now are going to start to answer some of the questions we've already received from the community. But remember, if you're on Facebook or YouTube, you can also add questions in the comments section. So first off, Tamia, you were actually on the front line on the floor doing the New York City surge in early 2020. What was that like? I definitely was there. Um, when I was actively working there, I'm not sure how I would have described it, but now I would refer to it as a life-changing experience that I would never forget. I can remember our very first patient that um, tested positive and he needed to be intubated. I was working that shift. I was standing outside of his room with one of my good friends on the floor and we froze for a few seconds, but it had to, to us feel like a few hours. In that moment, so many questions and concerns raced through my mind. Shortly after, the next thing I can remember is entering the room and seeing this patient look back at me. And he looked back at me as if he was just as scared or not even more as me. In that second, I immediately jumped into action and began caring for the patient as I normally would. I held his hand as he laid in bed scared while he was sedated and paralyzed. During his hospital stay, I had to watch him decompensate and fight for his life on a daily basis. I had to comfort his loved ones over the phone, unfortunately, because there were no visitors. And toward the end, we got iPads so they can see, but they weren't prepared to see what they were going to see. Um, I also was there, unfortunately, when it was time to prepare his body to go to the morgue. And my takeaway message from my experience in COVID-19 Huh? Oh. My takeaway experience from working on a COVID-19 floor is that COVID is 100% real. It can be deadly and it is something everybody should do their best to avoid becoming infected with. Wow, thank, thank you for sharing that. I guess it's good to know we now have a vaccine and we're seeing fewer of the severe cases that you saw in the beginning, but uh, we're hopeful. Dr. Kotkamp, there's a lot of concern about potentially having long-term side effects or extremely serious side effects. Should we be concerned about that? From the vaccine you mean, right? So I, one thing that we know from vaccines from the past is uh, that vaccines do not give long-term side effects. We see some reactions and it's very common to see reactions to vaccines in the first few hours, as we discussed earlier, and maybe in the first couple of days, there is not a single vaccine that can tell, that can give somebody a disease that is going to present in the next 10 years or in the next two years. So the critical time to have reaction is really those first 30 minutes. After that, we're pretty much good. Once the vaccine gets into your body, these particular vaccines, they get into the cell the message, which is that mRNA or that DNA code gets inside and then the cell, that's the job. And then the rest of the vaccine disappears. It's not that these vaccines are gonna be just going around your body and, and staying messing up with your cells for many, many years. They're just gonna do the job right after the shot. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, Dr. Langford, I talked to a lot of my medicine staff members and. And their rationalization of not getting the shot, they say in their mind, there's more negatives than positives in actually getting the vaccination. What should I be saying to them about that, those concerns? Okay, so I'm biased because I have a background in public health, but I would say, you know, what you're comparing is really some minor discomfort in reaction, potentially within a couple of days versus possibly dying of COVID or being hospitalized or having long-term effects. And uh, some of my friends have been very hesitant and don't want to get it because they say, well, I'm healthy and I you know, exercise and I eat well, and it's good to exercise. It's good to eat well. 
It's good to get good sleep, eat your fruits and vegetables, do all of those things, but you don't know how your body's going to react. You don't know if you're going to be one of those people who has a really, really bad situation with COVID and has to be in the hospital or possibly die or one of the people who recovers with relatively minor symptoms. You have no magic ball to know that. So for me, why risk it, right? Minor discomfort or possibly death in hospital. So for me, I'll take the minor discomfort. Anyway, right. but that's me. Okay. Well, I, I take that. Jamila, can you share information on the rollout of the vaccine in New York City and how people are actually able to sign up? Because we've all heard the frustration with the appointment systems, the supply chain issues, now how hard it is to get an appointment. What's really going on in our communities? Like we may have lost Jamela. Okay, we'll come back um, when she comes back on. Um, for the audience, we shared a lot of links to important information, but you don't have to write anything down. Um, all the information will be captured in the madisoncovid.eventbrite.com uh, website. So all the information that we've uh, spoken about tonight, so you don't have to write anything down. So let's keep going. Um, are you back, Jamela? Yes? Yes, I am. I'm just yeah. having some technical difficulties. I'm sorry about that. Okay, did you hear the question? Did you hear the question about uh, access to the vaccine and what's really going on? Sure. Um, so for, as, it pertains to the, as it pertains to the vaccine, um, in New York City, there's been a whole process there's been a whole process for um, making sure that New Yorkers are getting vaccinated. We know that we've seen issues with equity, um, specifically in how the vaccine was made accessible to certain communities. And um, our office really has just been doing two things. One, um, addressing some of the hesitancy that that um, we're seeing from black and brown communities. And then also just holding the city accountable to ensure that whether it's collecting data so that, you know, the city and the state accountable to know that to ensure that whether it's collecting data from, um, you know, who's being tested and who's being vaccinated, that the city can respond in a way that's equitable. So one of the things that um, I think is helpful for people to know, there were issues with um, people who wanted to set up appointments for vaccines. There is a vaccine website and as well as a vaccine hotline. Um, the state has also opened some additional sites. Mega Evers, which is um, located in a, a, a largely African American and Caribbean American community, um, is one of the state sites that just recently opened. They will be serving up, up to 3,000 individuals a day, um, giving those vaccines. And then another vaccine site was opened in Queens. Um, I believe both of them were opened this week also serve 3,000 individuals a day. So those are the types of things that we want to see. You know, those are things that we're pressing for, for from our office, just making sure that the individuals who have been the most um, impacted by COVID-19 and have experienced morbidity at disproportionate rates also have um, good access to the services that are being provided from both the city and the state. Great. So that's pretty much Looks where like we help. are. Um, there's a number that you know parents can call. Sorry? Now go ahead. There's a telephone number, and the number is one eight seven seven vax four NYC, and um, I think it might also be listed on the screen. Right, we will have that on the website. Well, thank you for that. And it sounds like there is hope in the near future for the uh, vaccination to be available to anyone who really needs it and is ready for it. Tamia, if someone has received the vaccination, can they still get COVID? Yes, they definitely can. Um, and I also just wanted to take the time to piggyback off of a source where I got my information from, the CDC. Um, Dr. Kotkamp and Dr. Langsford also spoke about this. But you should get vaccinated regardless of whether you got, or regardless of if you already had COVID-19. That is because scientists and researchers do not yet know how long you are protected from getting sick again after recovering from COVID-19. Even if you already recovered from COVID-19, it is possible, although rare, that you could be infected with the virus that causes COVID-19 again. There's a little bit of a waiting period depending on if you had COVID-19, which you were treated with, but 
never hesitate to have that conversation with your primary care provider, but you should still definitely get the vaccine. Wow. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. person has COVID to others? A person. Uh, so that's a very important question. We we don't know really the answer to that, and uh, but we're getting close. And you know, research is is going super fast in terms of COVID right now. They're doing more studies in people that are getting the vaccine, and they're following closely, uh, and they're looking if they are producing enough virus if they get infected, if they're producing enough virus enough to uh, um, make other people sick close to them. But we don't have a real answer yet with solid numbers. It looks like uh, the chances are less, but we don't have a definitely uh, a definite number or a definite percentage that can speak better as of right now. I suspect that uh, as we get more vaccinations out there, we can get more and more data on this particular question. One thing we know is that the production of the virus uh, of people that get vaccinated if they get COVID is a lot less compared to someone that doesn't uh, didn't get the vaccine. So we don't know yet. That's why we still recommend to use masks and to use and to keep doing the social distancing. But as we go through this pandemic and we get more data, we probably will learn, we will learn uh, new things about transmission. Okay, wow, okay. Dr. Langford, how should we evaluate sources so that we can determine if the information on the vaccine is legitimate? Because as you mentioned earlier, there is so much information flying around that you don't know what to believe. Right, so if you wanna be like me, I usually, will uh, defer to Dr. Fauci. So did Dr. Fauci say it, but not everybody's following Dr. Fauci. Other places that I like, as I mentioned, are cdc.gov and medlineplus.gov. But in general, whether you're looking for information about COVID-19 or diabetes or heart disease, when you go online, some of the things you want to look for when you come across a new website is, you know, who's behind the website? Is it an individual person in the world who had a, a, encounter with an illness and that's just their one story that they've put up is the website trying to sell you something um, most of the academic medical centers and places like the fda and the cdc and medlineplus.gov will have no advertisements so if you see a lot of pop-up ads to buy something that might be a, a, a concern if the website is asking you to give information. Most of the public yeah. websites are not asking you to give information like your address and your email and a credit card. So again, if that if that's coming up, that's a, a source of pause. You also want to look at the about us section and to see, again, who's behind the website? Do they have an editorial board? Um, any website that has doctors, you should know their credentials or nurses. So it should be MD, RN, PhD, et cetera. But they should also have their affiliations listed. So like if I'm ever on something, it says Aisha Langford, NYU Grossman School of Medicine. And another thing that I always like to tell people to think about is look at a date of when the information was posted. So for example, the, we have been dealing with COVID-19 for almost a year now. So if you go on a website and it says April of 2020, that was a very long time ago. A lot's happened since then. Actually, a lot's happened in the last two weeks. So you want to make sure that they have a date posted and you know when the information has been updated. So those are some other tips. Yeah, it's needed. There's a lot of information out there. Uh, Tamia. Does a vaccinated person still need to wear a mask, though? Because that's one that people just are arguing about on the airplanes and everything else. So what's the real story about wearing a mask if you got the vaccination? You definitely do. If you receive the COVID-19 vaccine, no matter how far you are out, you definitely still need to wear a mask. Because, again, researchers and scientists don't know whether getting a COVID-19 will prevent you from spreading the virus that causes COVID-19 to other people, even if you don't get sick yourself. So along with wearing the mask, we should still social distance, avoid crowds, and frequently wash our hands. Oh, thank you. Now, Dr. Cottenkamp, just when we thought we understood what the issues were and we knew what the game plan was, all of a sudden these variants started coming out of South Africa and everywhere else. 
So does yeah. current, what's the latest? Does the current vaccine protect against the new variants that are flying around and showing up everywhere? Great question. And you're right on target. We were ready like to just like COVID alone was enough. These variants have been uh, a pain. And uh, but the vaccines have been they are proving that they work in some of these variants in a way that is sufficient to keep the pandemic to the margin. So we have good data uh, with Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. We have uh, good data with Johnson and Johnson. There is uh, another a couple of vaccines that are coming out. So what they're doing, the companies, what they're doing right now is not only testing these vaccines in the regular the normal variant, but now they're going to these other variants. And even if the efficacy is not as good as initially it was, like if it's no longer 95%, we are happy with having anything above 50, you know, like some immunity is better than nothing. And the truth is that you can have like the most mutated virus, but if you do enough public uh, health measurements to keep the virus off transmission, that's no, then then you don't have to worry about that. So that's why it's important to keep doing the mask, the social distancing, the vaccines are gonna help. The faster we get vaccinated, the better, because less chances we give these virus to continue mutating. Okay. Um, Dr. Langford, this is a tough one. Do you have any tips for speaking with vaccine hesitant friends and family? Yes. So first, remember my, I think what I said in my maybe first slide is that it's very normal to be hesitant. It's normal to have concerns because this information has been so overwhelming. So I think the first step is really just to validate and affirm people and say, yeah, it totally makes sense that it's confusing and that people are uncertain. A lot of people feel that way. I would also recommend not being judgmental and not sounding like you're their mom or dad, because it's always annoying when someone is judging you. And it's always annoying when people give you unsolicited advice. So what I like to do is just to say, you know, tell me more about your concern. Or um, it's an interesting thing. I've actually been asking a lot of people, even when I go to like the corner bodega or like CVS to pick up something, you know, are you going to get the vaccine? And it's really interesting to hear people's reasons why or why not. So sometimes I just like to ask, is there anything, what do you think would be helpful to help you make a decision? And it might be something as simple as helping them get a cheat sheet about whatever the concern is. So I gave the example, a friend of mine has a close friend who has HIV and that person was concerned about whether or not people with HIV should get the vaccine. And the CDC has a really nice cheat sheet on what people should know who have HIV and the COVID-19 vaccine. So I was able to provide that link. I didn't do anything else, but I was able to be helpful with providing information. Another concern could just be simply, I don't have a ride to go to the vaccine center. And that's a very, or to a vaccination site. And that's a very different concern than not trusting vaccines altogether. So don't be judgmental be able to provide trusted sources of information when people ask you and try not to be judgmental. It's been a hard year for everybody. And I think we just all need to be really kind to each other. So don't be judgmental, be supportive, and really just let your family and friends know that you're there to support them however you can. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a tough one. Uh, I'm going to throw these last couple of questions out and uh, whoever uh, would like to answer, but Who's currently eligible for the vaccine and who will be next? We've heard about uh, children and teenagers, but what's the process in terms of what can we expect? Mm -hmm. So we have, um, I think this is going to be up to each city, I will say. Uh, we're putting different recommendations as, you know, each, each city will have different recommendations. What is pertinent to New York City we know that uh, patients that are a lot above 65 can get it, uh, first responders, and there is a large list about uh, first responders. Uh, educators, and it doesn't only include teachers, but uh, people that work in the education system and that are care providers to children, those are eligible. And um, and most recently started, we uh, included all people with comorbidities. So anything from hypertension, asthma, history of cancer, any anyone with an, any comorbidity is eligible for the vaccine as of now. Mm -hmm. Now with the kids 
we know that the vaccines that are approved in the US are so far and, and soon Johnson and Johnson, but right now we have uh, Moderna and Pfizer and uh, Moderna is for 16 and plus, Pfizer for 18 and plus, uh, 16 and plus. So 14 and 16. We don't have any vaccine approved yet for kids below 14. And we hope we can get this data as soon as possible from the ongoing trials. Wow. Now here's one that has some humor to it, but it's very serious. I literally have friends who will eat a hot dog off the, hot, off the street, a hot dog stand, and not worry about what's in it. But all of a sudden, they become vaccine experts. <laughs> And so we've actually had discussions about this emergency use authorization versus a fully licensed vaccine and why they know what the difference is and why it makes a difference on whether they're going to take it or not. So someone can please address what is the difference between being fully licensed versus this emergency use authorization. Yeah, I think it's, it's just the urgency. Um, we, as you know, we, we have people that are working the FDA and they have a regular schedule. Uh, there are items in the agenda that include flu shots, uh, the shots for other diseases, and they all need attention and reviews and committees, but we're in the pandemic. So right now we are prioritizing COVID and that's what it means. It's an emergency use. This is We're not gonna go through like the same agenda of the monthly meeting and waiting for like the nice setting, we need to get this done now. So that's what it is, the emergency use authorization. Okay. The safety is not cut, the data is there. So it's not about cutting safety down. Okay, here's another real life discussion with, with friends. I'm gonna shop for the Johnson & Johnson versus the Moderna versus the Pfizer. So I'm gonna choose between which one I think is gonna be the best. What's the answer to that? What do we, what's the answer to shopping around, um, especially when you mentioned Dr. Conkab earlier, I believe the, the efficacy is lower for Johnson & Johnson. So should we be shopping around? I can definitely take my, I can take a stab at that one because that's something that I got from my parents because um, I do identify as African-American and I was the first one in my family to get it. So they were just like, oh, I want the one you got. And I was just like, you need to get whichever one is available to you when you get your appointment, when you become eligible. We need more than one company to make vaccines because there are too many people in this world for just one company to make a vaccine. And then I also asked my parents when they asked me, I was like, when you get your annual flu shot, do you go into your doctor and ask which company made your flu shot? They don't. So we definitely have to take whichever vaccine is accessible to us when we become eligible. And I, I also wanted just to add to that, all of the va vaccines, kind of the endpoints have been, does this prevent severe disease and death and reduce hospitalizations. And they all have done that. So again, kind of keeping the bigger picture in, in, in mind. And then also one of the benefits of the Johnson and Johnson um, vaccine is that it's one shot and it can be uh, just refrigerated in like re regular refrigerator. So back to that question about equity and fairness and distrib distribution, there may be logistical challenges, uh, or maybe not challenges, there are logistical considerations for each of the vaccines. So for example, Pfizer has to be kept um, at very, very cold temperatures in special freezers that a lot of academic medical settings may have. But if you're trying to get something out to a rural area in the middle of, you know, Kentucky, that may not be a reality and it's two shots. And so for people, depending on their work life, their situation, where they have to go, if they have transportation. So there are other uh, logistical considerations that might make one more appealing to a community over another um, in the broad effort to get as many people vaccinated as possible. So those are other considerations. Okay. And watching the time, we're going to have time for a couple more questions. But in the chat box, we've actually had a number of questions that are asking again about fertility and the impact on pregnancy. So I know it was covered earlier, but I believe Dr. Cottencamp, if you can maybe give an, a refresh on that topic since it's on people's minds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So definitely it's a concern um, from the perspective that, as you guys know, when we're doing trials, we initially start with population that is healthy. And then we move to the population that have some, some degree of diseases 
but doing research in pregnant women is very tricky because many times products are going to be just fine, but we are not going to risk uh, a new life, you know, trying to test something that has not been tested before. So everything has an order. And uh, normally when the studies look very good in the regular population, non-pregnant, then we can move to that special population that is pregnant women and children. And that's where we are right now. So for the uh, for a pregnant woman, I will say it is, it is very important to take into consideration that risk benefit. We know that COVID can be very severe for uh, pregnant women. And also it can be very bad for the babies. The babies can be born and, and they will need to be in the uh, MICU uh, and they will require, require special you know, therapies and things like that because they can become preterm. So when you put into that that risk versus the benefit of getting the vaccine, then you have to have that sincere discussion with your doctor and with yourself. Like you want to risk yourself of getting COVID and going through a really bad experience and, you know, pregnancy can make you at risk of having really bad disease or you want to take the chance. And taking the chance uh, is, is, is demonstrated right now that it's worth it. We have a lot of people that have become pregnant, not only during the studies, but that have taken the shot. So I think uh, if I was in that situation personally, myself, I will take the vaccine. I will choose to take the vaccine. Now, fertility, that's a different topic. And uh, this comes a lot in the questions. And um, there is no evidence that these vaccines will change or alter in any way fertility. These are I, you know, like when when these questions come around, you just uh, have to explain like the biology. But the biology is that this vaccine goes into your cells that are like located in your axilla. And that's where the immune cells are located right after the shot. And that's where all the magic happens. So there's no way that uh, your cells, your eggs or things like that are going to be out there from a product like this. Yeah. These vaccines, sorry if I'm extending too much, but I think it's a very good topic. Um, the, there is data in animals as well, and uh, the data in animals is also very clean. So that is also reassuring. And just to, to, to add one more thought, um, that's true for men and women. So it's been brought to my to attention that some men have asked if it's going to affect their fertility, but also their sexual function. And there's no evidence that the vaccines will do that. And as I mentioned earlier, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine actually um, says that the vaccine should not be withheld from uh, people who are trying to conceive and have a child and vaccination is a way to keep yourself healthy and you want to be as healthy as possible if you're trying to have a baby, both men and women. All right, two more questions. This next one is very specific, so I want to ask it. Uh, someone is in that 2% population for an allergic reaction for whatever reason. They, they feel confident that they will have an allergic reaction. Are there any special protocols that they can follow as opposed to going to the mass vac? vaccination sites and just kind of standing in line and trying to figure out what they should do? Is there any specific direction you can give them? So for this particular patient, uh, important to bring that up before the vaccination. So in case that a reaction can happen, people know. Uh, important to remember that the people that is giving you the vaccine are medically trained. So you're not getting this shot from, you know, the, the guy of the kiosk in the corners, you're getting these vaccines from medical professionals. So if someone is gonna have a reaction, we are prepared to take care of that. Okay, good. And, oh, sorry, one other piggyback. Okay. Um, so I actually got my vaccine through the clinical trial. So when I got my both of my shots, they actually made me stay there, I think for like 45 minutes to an hour, just to make sure I was fine. I am not at the vaccination sites, but I think everyone who gets the first and second shot also has to stay for a period of time just to be monitored. I think it's about 30 minutes or so, but you all can correct me. So it's not like they give you the shot and say, hey, have a good day, walk out the door. There is a period that they can watch you just to make sure that you're not going to be one of the, the minority of people that has a severe reaction. So that's hopefully that gives comfort as well. Well, thank you. And this is the last question. 
I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Langford, since you're a population expert in the communities. Uh, clearly, our communities of color in New York City and the Bronx and Brooklyn have been hit hardest by COVID. What do you think the government and private sector should be doing to help prioritize serving the needs of our communities that are hit the hardest? Right. So those conversations are already happening. I have been on some uh, a vaccine task force calls with borough president uh, Gail Brewer. So I'm sure there's other similar conversations happening and those are weekly and several community organizations, folks that represent NYCHA, folks that represent senior centers are all really advocating that the vaccines be available in our communities. And so I think um, as the vaccines become more available and as the rollout gets more streamlined and organized, you will see uh, vaccination sites popping up in more neighborhoods because you know it's the more difficult it is for people to get somewhere and especially somewhere far, the less likely they are to actually get the vaccination. So those conversations are happening. And I am really encouraged that there are a variety of people who are represented on those calls and town halls like this, people who are brown and black and different religions and different ages, because for people to feel more comfortable, they want to see people who look like them, who are like them in other ways, however you define it, like you could be another teacher or another mom or dad or someone who's like right in your neighborhood. So we all define what being like me is is about. Um, so I'm encouraged that that's happening. And I also um, am, enc am encouraged that um, even though early on people were talking about, you know, black and brown people are afraid and Tuskegee and no one's going to get the vaccine. And so I don't want to downplay medical mistrust and historic abuses, but I also don't want us to lose sight that the majority of people, white, black, Hispanic, and other races, the majority of people have expressed that they are willing to get the vaccines and that's encouraging. And those numbers keep going up. They've been increasing over the last five months. So I, I want all of us to really focus on the positive news and that people in general um, seem to be open to getting the vaccines and everyone's not afraid and paranoid, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Well, oh, great. Well, thank you. I want to thank everyone at home for tuning in. I know I've learned a lot about how the vaccine works, why it's safe, and also how to get it. I truly hope tonight, though, that we're not preaching to the choir. And I hope that some of you will use this information and tomorrow make an appointment to get your shot. So that's my personal goal for tonight's session. Please share this video with friends and family. If you have further questions or miss part of the video, you can find all of it on madisoncovid.eventbrite.com. I wanna give a special thank you to our panelists for sharing their knowledge with us tonight and for fighting for us on the front lines. Thanks to everyone at the NYU Langone Health Center, Madison Square Boys and Girls Club, the Office of the Public Advocate, and Dowell Consulting, who work behind the scenes to help make this event possible. Stay safe, everyone, and have a wonderful evening. Good night. My name is Josiah Aaron from Tianto. We the team, the Thomas S. Murphy Clubhouse, would like to thank the frontline workers for their sacrifice during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you! Thank you.